at home, if you put a reward chart for good behavior up for your own kids at home, you know what you're saying to your kids? The message you are sending is you're normally rotten, but if you should happen to be good, you'll get a reward. See the difference? It's personal. My daughter gets very sensitive and starts crying when I try to give her feedback about something she did wrong. She doesn't like any criticism or anything. And then someone wrote, because you trust her, it's a compliment to her. Is that what you're answering there? Because I would totally disagree with that. Okay, so my daughter gets very sensitive and starts crying when I try to give her feedback about something she did wrong. She doesn't like any criticism or anything. I don't know how old she is, but that, it's a bit of a tell. It means that you're actually criticizing her. Why are you criticizing her? Do you need to give her feedback? Did she ask for it? Yeah, I don't know what you're getting at there. I'd want to know. The only reason you didn't put an age, the only reason I'm asking is what are you criticizing? What are you what are you critiquing? Is it something that's necessary or are you just insulting her basically? You once said when you're ignoring a tantrum, this is a really good question by the way. You once said when you're ignoring a tantrum to not be on your phone because it's rude. I say that all the time. Yeah. Instead, file your nails. What about reading a book? What is rude versus what is just keeping yourself occupied? Reading a book is more your your mind is elsewhere. Looking at your phone, your mind is elsewhere. Filing your nails, you want to look like this is on your mind. The tantrum is on your mind, but this is how you're reacting to it. I would look out at the trees. I would be maybe be doing dishes, but I wouldn't do something that makes it look like my mind is otherwise occupied. I wouldn't read. I wouldn't get into a conversation with someone. I wouldn't go on my phone. It's important that they look like you're just doing a little chore, filing your nails, waiting for that ridiculous tantrum to stop. That's the message you're sending. See the difference? What do you do about an eight-year-old boy who talks back and has smart remarks? He's just reflecting your parenting, so work on yourself. They're, between the ages of three and 12 years old, all of their behavior is a direct result of your parenting. It's a direct result of your leadership or lack of. So work on your leadership skills, and they don't talk back. They just don't do that. So yeah, it's just a tell. It means you're not a leader. Work on you. Check out the boot camp course. That's all about you and your leadership. And it teaches you how to be a leader by giving respect to get it. Um, you meet their needs and manage their wants. How to build self-esteem in kids. Give them something to be proud of. Their behavior, for one thing. Um, that's why it's so important to be a leader because you bring out the best in kids. And when they feel, when they're nice to people, they feel good about themselves. They have high self-esteem. Being good people makes increases their self-esteem. If you allow them to be snotty and disrespectful and misbehave, their self-esteem is in the toilet. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Um, my uh, son's grade two teacher called me on her lunch break to tell me this. She said, um, I have to tell you this. It was so funny. She asked my son, why are you so nice? And he just looked up at her. Mommy makes us be nice. Like they knew they were nice kids. They were proud of themselves. And plus they heard it everywhere they went. Your kids are so nice. Oh my goodness. They're so nice. That makes them feel good. Give them something to be proud of. Good behavior is something to be proud of. You can do that by being a leader for them. Okay. So in a classroom, you can have a, a reward chart for good behavior. you got 30 kids. They don't take it personally, okay? At home, if you put a reward chart for good behavior up for your own kids at home, you know what you're saying to your kids? The message you are sending is you're normally rotten, but if you should happen to be good, you'll get a reward. See the difference? It's personal. Very different. That's why a huge portion of my clients are teachers, principals, child psychologists. I couldn't do any of your jobs. Um, so, but they struggle with parenting. Parenting is personal. It's different. There's a whole bunch of stuff that just doesn't cross over. You can have all the degrees you want about kids, but parenting is personal. It's completely different. That's all I specialize in is parenting. Because when I was working with kids, and I've worked with hundreds of kids and teenagers, I was mothering them. I was very much in a maternal feeling role. Um, I wasn't there teaching them stuff. The teenagers used to laugh because I was supposed to be helping them with math or something. And they'd laugh and they said, could you even do grade three math? No, I don't think so. No, I was there for behavior mentor because like, a behavior mentor. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's very different roles, extremely different. Like I've got uh, one principal. She was so cute. She was one of my favorite clients last year. She was just a doll. And uh, she's just funny and she's really interesting. And she's a principal. She goes, so easy running a school, running my own kids at home. Very different. So, yeah, she can run a whole school, but running, you know, her own household with her own kids because it's personal. I feel like I'm constantly repeating myself to kids when asking them to do something. So that's, you already answered your own question. Uh, you're repeating yourself. I, I would never do that. Um, start, just look at the behavior board. It's completely free or go to the boot camp course. That's the next level up. It's not free. 
So uh, you might want to check out, check into your leadership skills, because if you're repeating yourself, like I just wouldn't do it. I mean, once I say something, um, yeah, it's happening. So, or there's a consequence if it doesn't. You got to be fair and reasonable. Are you asking them something that's fair and reasonable or are you just being too demanding some days? I don't know. Sometimes parents are very inconsistent and then they all of a sudden, okay, that's it. I'm in charge now. I'm going to, now you listen to me. So one day you're wishy-washy and you're giving in, you're yelling. And then the next day you just to say, you got to be consistent. That's what I'm all about. I train you how to be consistent. Check out the boot camp course. Teaches you how to get respect over five weeks and it's consistency, but you start small. You start with a behavior board. It's three to 12 years old. Behavior boards are teach. Like I would never use a behavior board. It's just a teaching tool. You're learning how to do this and you're starting small one step at a time. Like I'm level 10 with what I teach because I invented it. So, but when you're learning, you got to do level one, level two, level three. So you're learning. Okay. Like I would deal with everything in day one. Would it all be solved? Not in day one, probably by day two or three. But I would deal with everything in day one. If I threw that at you, it wouldn't work. Uh, you got to start with one behavior per week. And you master that one, then the next one, then the next one, you're starting to get it. You're starting to learn how to do this. Our four-year-old hates taking baths. It's a daily struggle. Any leader parenting tips to help get through bath time without a fight? Um, oh, I got a lot of different tips for that. Could they have a shower potentially? That's one thing. Also, what have you got in there for them to do? Have you got all that? I'm sure you've tried it all, all that coloring stuff and everything. Um, or you can get like coloring stuff for the tiles in the bathroom, but I've been told to watch out for that with grout. Um, but yeah, so get something for them to do. And then also just say, look, here's an incentive. If you have a shower, I'll put on, you can get a waterproof cover, maybe put his favorite show on just while he's in the bath or in the shower. So um, like on your phone or something. So yeah, I don't know, have some incentive. Do you know, I mean, you want to get that solved now. I got, I know a lot of teenagers uh, don't like taking showers or baths and that's a lot harder to get a teenager to look after their hygiene. I know it's situational based, but could you give some examples of ways not to tell a kid, use your words, like kids whining, yelling, or throwing things or throwing tantrums? Well, they're all different approaches. So tantrums, basically you ignore a tantrum. Um, and whining, you don't say much about whining. And I don't know how old they are, by the way. And yelling, yeah, or throwing, yeah. Um, I don't know their age. If they're a three and over, check out my behavior board and you might want to look into the boot camp course. It covers kind of everything. Uh, but attitude, whining is in the attitude department um, and also yelling is. We can never put no yelling for kids because it's in the attitude department. So that's the last thing that corrects itself and it happens organically. You never address attitude. It just happens organically. It, it improves organically once you're a leader. It's the last thing that happens once you've set up your leadership skills. Check out my boot camp course. It's all about your leadership. Remember, we're not fixing kids here. We're teaching parents. Three and a half year old wakes up very angry. Mornings are slightly better than afternoon naps. How to improve his mood quickly. You don't. You can't improve a mood quickly. Um, you can just let him chill. Just read a book to him. Let him read a book. Um, you can turn on a show for him short, for a short period of time. Um, but yeah, just let just let him. It has something to do with body temperature, I've heard. I don't know. But my son used to wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Not every time, but sometimes. And it was more likely to be during a nap, which he didn't nap often. But if he did, he'd often wake up grisly. Some people, adults even wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm a morning person. I'm quite nauseating. I wake up very cheery, um, but I'm not cheery at night. I get very sleepy at night. So I just want, I get tired <laughs> very easily. What do I need to do to work on myself? As I always yell, and it seems like I'm not being heard. Well, you're not being heard because you're yelling. Yelling, it doesn't work. Um, check out the behavior board. It's completely free. Everything I have is in the link above and it'll teach you how, like you put no yelling on the behavior board as your rule and it'll call attention to it. And then you have to play tag with the kids or something. You have to do something. If you yell at them, you have to make it up to them. You have to do something fun. It'll just call, not only will it call attention to your yelling and make you want to stop if you have to play hide and seek with them every time you yell. It also, it's bonding with the kids, right? That's showing them that you're a leader, that you're accountable. If you're accountable, they're more likely to be accountable. That's why that behavior board, everybody's on that. I've heard there's lots of other people out there doing that now. I invented that. I put parents on the behavior board. I invented that like 16 years ago. Says, is it okay to give a warning before a consequence for a three-year-old? I've been giving consequences a lot today. For example, if he's running on couch, can I give him a warning and then give consequence? Not if he already knows it's naughty. You can't. In other words, you're allowed to do something bad once. He already knows it's bad, so we should never do it. You can't. 
Uh, it's kind of like the countdown method. Uh, let's say they're hitting someone and you say, if you don't stop hitting by the count of three, you'll be in trouble, buddy. One, two, and they keep pounding, pounding. You're teaching them it's okay to do the bad thing in the short term, but not in the long term. So you're actually condoning it for the short term. Now, if they already know it's bad, you have to have a consequence for each time they do it. Otherwise, they're just, they're always going to think, well, I can get away with it once every time. It's a, it's a mixed message. Most parents tend to overpraise and underplay. Do you know play, play is your children's love language? Praise doesn't do much for them. If you have a five-year-old, let's say you have a five-year-old little, little boy and he's staring at you and you say to him, you're wonderful, you're smart, you can do anything you want. I'm so proud of you. I'm going to go do the dishes now. This is his face. Praise, what did it do for him? Not much. You say to that same five-year-old little boy, hey, what are you doing? Can I play too? Watch his face, right? So praise is overused and play is underused. I'm not saying to never praise and I'm not saying to play 24 hours a day, but be very aware of that. Are you overpraising and underplaying? Praise is not their love language. You think it is, but you're wrong. Play is their love language. This is another one that I talk about and I told my kids this. Um, teach your kids to never be proud of their gifts, but be proud of their actions. I told my kids, if you're born gifted, you're born beautiful, don't take pride in that. That's just luck, okay? Be grateful when people praise you for it. Say thank you, you know, be, be polite, but don't take pride in it. You take pride in how you treat people, how you act and what you do. So I always told my kids that never be proud of things that you were just born with. Never be proud of something that you didn't have to work for or don't put any effort into. That was really important to me. I'm gonna teach you how to teach children to share now. Two-year-olds can't really share. They're not very good. They don't get it. They don't get the concept. You can teach them how not to grab stuff off other people, though. So it's sort of, in essence, sharing. But then you have to be in charge of sharing. And I'll tell you a good example of that. Let's say you go to the park and you got two little ones, a two and a three-year-old or three and a four-year-old. Probably more like a three and a four-year-old for this. But anyway, so you got little ones and you go to the park and there's only one swing. I would say I always take charge of these situations. I try and see stuff, the trouble that might come up and I try and head it off, right? So I'd say, oh, there's only one swing and there's two of you. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to take turns swinging and each turn gets two minutes. I'm going to time it and we're going to flip a coin or hold a rock in my hand. You guess which hand. Whoever wins that, you go first. But the first turn gets one minute. So the first turn you get to go first, but you only get one minute. And then every turn after that, you get two minutes. And then you start doing it. Okay, so they're learning about fairness and they're learning how to problem solve. So they might actually start doing stuff like this. They can just count to 20 or whatever, and you know, like take turns or count to 60, whatever it is. So they can take turns swinging. The whole idea is that you'll start doing this. They're going to get bored with it. They're end up going to both going over to the swing anyway or the teeter-totter or something else. Um, so do they even have teeter-totters anymore? I guess they kind of abolished those because a lot of kids are going under there and getting clunked in the head. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you're teaching them how to problem solve, how to share, how to organize stuff. So yeah. Something that comes up a lot in coaching too is, oh, just so much, so much of this, a lot of guilt and shame, mostly with the mom. Dads have it too, but they don't tend to verbalize it as much. They tend to verbalize it more in anger and frustration, but I know it's guilt and shame too. There's no point in that. It doesn't, it gets in our way. When I'm coaching people, I say, can you just leave that somewhere else, the guilt and the shame? Because I'm not about talking about yesterday. I'm about today and tomorrow. You know, um, therapists talk about the past. Coaches talk about the future. So I'm all uh, future-based. So if you're thinking, if you're feeling guilty or ashamed of the way you've parented in the past, let it go. You did the best you knew how, right? So everyone does the best they know how and guilt and shame will get you nowhere. They get in your way, if anything. OK, and you tend to overcompensate sometimes and then the kids get more out of control. Then you yell at them again. You see, it's just it, it doesn't help you at all. So Yeah, no room for guilt and shame. Um, doesn't it doesn't serve you. Um, and like I said, everyone does the best they know how. No parent is handed a baby in the hospital and says, I'm going to mess you up. Everyone goes, I'm going to do the best. I'm going to be the best mom, the best dad. Everyone does the best they know how. OK, so let's say your parents messed you up. They did the best they knew how. I get this in coaching a lot. Parents talking about how horrible their parents were. <laughs> so I say, yeah, they did the best they knew how. So not the best they could, the best they knew how. My daughters don't get along and it drives me manic. They are 11 and 14 years old. You can't force kids and siblings to like each other. They love each other, but you can't force them to be friends. So uh, did you say they're two girls? My daughters, yeah, your two daughters don't get along. 11 and 14 years old. Uh, okay. 
One thing to avoid doing is when you've got kids who don't get along, you don't do, you don't do one on one time with it, either of them or any of them. You do group stuff. So you do stuff with them together and you always play to the weakest link. Do stuff that the 11 year old will be just as good at as you and the other one. So it's nothing really competitive. You might just go shopping or window shopping or you might go to the arcade and do stuff there. Uh, you might go go karting. You might go, you know, just do something where it's just kind of fun, not competitive, and you're doing it together. It teaches them how to get along. If they're getting along with you there, um, they're more likely to get along when you're not there. So do stuff with them. Don't single them out. And if they start fighting, just say, well, you can sit there for a minute and you sit there and we'll just sit here. We'll wait for a minute and then we'll try again. So keep separating them when they do argue. Say, okay, you go over there, you go over there, and then we'll, we'll try again. I got a million different ideas for that. That's just some general advice. Okay, so is it normal to have 20 plus consequences a day? Well, it could happen if that's what you're doing, but that's not what you do. So let's say that they the rule is no hitting and they hit twice and you've had a consequence each time. By the third hit, don't tell them this ahead of time. By the third set hit, you say to them, I'll tell you what, you've hit three times today, so we're going to go straight to media blackout now. Check out the behavior board and that will make sense, okay? So you start with a positive action, that's the consequence. If they won't do it or if they've done, you know, they've done the bad behavior too many times, then you resort to the second consequence, which is the um, the negative deprivation. You take something away. So, and then also, and then parents always say to me, yeah, but what if they keep hitting during the 24 hour media blackout at the most, I might say, that's why you've got media blackout. It's going to be hell. Yes, it is. But if they're learning, okay. Okay. What's an appropriate age to start screen time? Well, I think babies can watch some stuff. Uh, I'll give you a, a good example. I was out with my daughter-in-law and my uh, granddaughter my granddaughter's just five months old and we went out for lunch and we were like, Oh geez, who knows how long this is going to last. We might just have to get, get it to go. So um, she was really good. She was just sitting there in her little seat and just looking around, looking at her hands, you know how they are. <laughs> and you can see she was starting to get finicky. Well, generally once she starts crying, that's sort of it. So um, quickly the mother was frantically getting the phone out and putting that vegetable face thing that goes across a black screen. And she's just enamored with it. It's a great tool to use when you're out somewhere and you want to be able to sit and relax and have a meal. So yeah, I'm not against any of that. I think it's great. Whatever works. Oh God, you're going to hate my answer. It's Toretta. Hi Lisa. How do I parent an entitled 12 year old that is really attitude with me, but lacks confidence in reading and socially is struggling. She's my oldest. So I'm lost. How do I parent an entitled 12 year old that is really attitude with me? Work on yourself, work on your leadership skills. If she's your oldest and you've got kids that are younger, check out my boot camp course. Because all that stuff comes from lack of leadership. Their behavior is 100% a direct result of your parenting between the ages of 3 to 12 years old. So that's on you, which is good news. It means you can change you. You don't try and change your children or fix your children. You work on yourself. You educate yourself on leadership. And the attitude just goes away. It just does. It's the last thing to go, by the way, is the attitude. Um, a lot of parents say this to me. When does the attitude change? I said, you'll know when you're a leader when the attitude goes away. Um, my now four-year-old daughter always runs and runs away from. So there, you got a runner. Put on, put her on a leash. Get a leash. Put a harness on her before you go out and say, if you run, you're going to get clipped into this leash. And is that what you mean by a runner? They're although at four years old, they're not usually running. But anyway, there's four things that children are born to do, at, or they're never going to do. Okay, I'm going to read those out. I already know them anyway. One is tantrums, one is running, one is climbing, and one is hitting. They're either born with that DNA, that genetic code, whatever it is, they're either going to do those things, all four of them, two of them, one of them, or none of them. They're either born to do those things or they're never going to do them, okay? It's not your fault if they do them, but it, it, it's up to you to sort of train them out of those bad behaviors. If only one parent should be a leader. Um, the other does that mean that the other parent doesn't get respect? No, they can get respect by osmosis. So I'll give you a good example. My mom was a leader. My dad was the pleaser, but he figured out, he would say to me, do you want me to check with mom first? And I would go, never mind. And the same thing with me and my ex-husband. He was the pleaser. I was the leader. So we were, we were on the same page. So he got respect because all he had to say, if the kids tried to push him around, was he'd say, do you want me to tell mom? And that's all it took. So we were on the same page. We were like a united front as parents. So they do get respect, but it's because you're the powerhouse behind it. <laughs> and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. How do you get an almost three-year-old to stop hitting as soon as we take something away? You just physically restrain them. You say no, and you physically hold them. You don't look at them or talk to them after that, though. It's, it's physical. But if they're almost three, put them on the behavior board and say no hitting. And every time they hit, there's a consequence. 
Uh, it explains it in the behavior board. That is the example on the behavior board. If you yell, you start with no yelling for you. If they hit, you start with no hitting for them. The behavior board starts at the age of three. Does physical restraint work at six years old? She hits me or herself during a tantrum. Okay, not necessarily. As they get bigger, you don't physically restrain them. So you just put down no hitting and then you just have consequences. It's a slow burn. They'll learn eventually. But in the meantime, it's going to be hell. Okay. But if they're six years old and they're still having tantrums, you want to work on your leadership skills. Tantrums usually stop by three and a half to four if you're a leader. Okay, they learn how to control themselves because they know they've got a leader. They know those tantrums are never going to work. Past the age of four, they only do what works. If they're still having tantrums after the age of four, it means they're working. You're feeding it somehow. Pretty much guaranteed. So, yeah, work on your leadership skills. Check out my boot camp course. It teaches you how to be a leader in five weeks. It's an online course. It's got lots of videos and written stuff in there. And it's really good reference material for down the road because it goes from three to 12 years old. So you can imagine that's a very wide range, but your parenting is very similar. Their problems are different, though. So I've got a whole bunch of different stuff, different age stuff in there. What to do when a seven-year-old talks back after consequences are given? What can I do? Unless they say a bad word, like a swear word or something. If they say, I hate you, I hate you, this would be what I would do. So you said, okay, your consequence is this because you broke that rule. I hate you, you're lousy. I would go, whatever, and then just walk away. Don't feed into it. They're just trying to get under your skin. If they get under your skin, they just won away. How do you deal with lying? Put down no lying on the behavior board. Just say it like it is, no lying. If they steal, put down no stealing. OK, um, but never put attitude. We're putting actions on there, except for uh, bad words or name calling. Those are the only two things that are sort of attitude, but I will put on there. So it's just actions other than that. But yeah, put no lying on the behavior board. Regarding the six year old tantrum, she was a good toddler. Tantrum started late around four or five. That is really unusual. Uh, they don't usually start tantrums at that age. I'd want to know why. Are you a pleaser parent? Is that your style? Pleaser parents, that can happen with pleaser parents because they do tend to get entitled and tend to start having tantrums when they don't get their own way. So um, yeah, that's the only reason I've ever heard of that happening. Unless they go through some kind of trauma that upsets them and sparks that behavior. Um, but yeah, you might wanna check out the boot camp course, work on your leadership skills and tantrums should stop.